I'm recording this episode of Datages, the first week of January 2024. I'd like to simply start by saying Happy New Year, but I'm going to follow that with a sad message. The Datages friends and family lost one of its true luminaries. I'm sad to say that Dr. Mark Woolston came to the end of his battle with leukemia and left us prior to the new year, but he didn't really leave us because the wisdom he shared will be with us forever. And I'm going to bring you some more of that wisdom today. So please join me in a moment of silence in honor of Mark. Maybe you can hear the echoes of his wise words hanging in that silence. Just listen. Thank you all and enjoy this episode of Datages. Welcome, friends and family. I'll try to level my emotions in, in sharing with you this dedication. Today's episode of Datages is dedicated to Dr. Mark Goulston. If you haven't listened to my two-part interview with Mark, what he shared with all of us is far more important than anything I might have to offer. So I ask you hit pause and go listen to that episode now. I'll be right here when you get back, I promise. Mark has had a profound impact on my life in the brief time that I knew him. I feel blessed to have engaged with him in a meaningful way in the final two months of his life. I also feel privileged to have brought some of his profound wisdom and knowledge to all of you and the Datages friends and family. If all I ever got out of the investment of my time, effort, energy, and resources that I put into Datages was those two months of engagement with Mark, it was all worth it. But the beautiful thing is that I get so much more out of Datages. The positive impact of writing and sharing my thoughts, the meaningful interaction with our guests and the ongoing relationship I've built with all of you and the friends and family are truly priceless to me. But within the gratitude I hold for all of that, let me try to capture why my interaction with Mark meant so much to me. If you listened carefully to the Datages episode featuring Mark, you heard from a man who was nearing the end of his life, eyes wide open, and he was only concerned about what he could do for me and what value he could bring to all of you and the Datages friends and family. After Mark's family told me of his passing, I went to his podcast, I'm Dying to Tell You, and I watched his last two posts. His final post, four days before he passed, was a tribute to the nursing staff and the oncology ward and the precision and kindness they brought to their daily routine. He found them inspiring and was grateful for the care they provided, but it was his penultimate post that was the essence of Mark Goulston. In it, he talks about the incredible struggles ahead of him after having full body radiation treatment to kill every bit of bone marrow in his entire body. Was he looking for sympathy? No. He was looking for inspiration. What type of inspiration? Let's hear it from Mark directly. Welcome to another episode of I'm Dying to Tell You. This is Dr. Mark Goulston uh, wearing my hospital gown. And I want to talk to you about needing your help to motivate myself. I've been told that what I'm going through and what I'm about to go through is going to just knock me flat and how important it is for me to move, to walk when I don't want to. It was a real struggle getting out of bed today after a, a, a total body radiation procedure. And I think you can help me because if you will do something to help yourself. And I know you're doing that. That'll help motivate me to do something I don't want to do. You can actually use this with your family. I mean, think, think of it with your spouse or your teenagers, reaching out to them and say, I need your help with something. I need your help to get motivated to do something that I just don't want to do. And that could be things like exercise and dieting and, and uh, uh, dealing with your temper. And, and you can, I can tell you that when I know that my children are doing something that they don't want to do, but that is going to better them, just picturing them doing that will motivate me to get my lazy rear end out of bed and moving uh, 
it's not easy, but once I start, it really works. So I could use your help. If you're a subscriber to this, if you can do a deal with me, if in your comments you could say, uh, Mark, Dr. Mark, um, it's a deal. If you can push yourself every day to do the stuff that you don't want to do so that you can get better, I'm going to do A, B, and C. So try that out in your community. Try that out in your family. Try that out in your company. I think it's also a great way to build culture and build engagement. So give that a try and share in your comments uh, what you're going to do that you don't want to do uh, because I really need to be inspired by you. Thanks again. That's the essence of Mark Goulston. Please do something to take care of yourself and share it with me. That will be my inspiration. Beautiful, Mark. As those of you who have been following Datages already know, Mark is the author of what is now one of my favorite books entitled Just Listen. The wisdom and practical instruction he offers in the book will positively impact your life. It really applies to all aspects, professional, family, and social life, and provides you with actionable lessons and tools that you can apply to those parts of your life. We were truly blessed to have Mark as a guest on Datages and as a member of the Datages Friends and Family. Whether you caught his episode in November of 2023 or just went back and listened to it now, you know that Mark applied his superpowers of listening to help coach me through some challenging topics I was facing in my personal and philanthropic life. As it relates to the, the war in the Middle East and the massive impacts it's had here in the United States, particularly in the realm of higher education. What you don't know is that Mark continued to advise me through the end of 2023, which ultimately was through the end of his life, helping me to navigate difficult discussions with friends who were viscerally impacted by the terror attacks in Israel, by the ensuing war, and by the unrest that precipitated here at home. I can safely say that Mark helped me to save several friendships that were in jeopardy during these, this tense period. I experienced in the early days following October 7th, conflicts and arguments with close friends who were demonstrating highly emotional responses to the tragedy in Israel. These dramatic responses came across as illogical and irrational. Why? Because they were. By definition, emotional responses are irrational, but that does not make them invalid. What Mark really taught me through his writings and his personal advice was to look past the issue at hand, to look past the cognitive dissonance that was causing my friends to exhibit anger, frustration, contempt, and hostility, and to understand that what was driving those reactions was underlying fear, sadness, loss, and remorse. By practicing the power of listening, I could take time to understand the context of their behavior. And yes, contrary to what Congresswoman Elise Stefanik might try to convince you, context does matter. Why? Let's talk about this a bit. Biblical scholars tackle this topic frequently, and they say it like this. Text without context is pretext. Okay, so what's pretext? I don't often cite Wikipedia here on Datages, but in this case, I really like the explanation that Wikipedia has to offer. A pretext is an excuse to do something or say something that is not accurate. Pretexts may be based on a half-truth or developed in the context of a misleading fabrication. Pretexts have been used to conceal the true purpose or rationale behind actions and words. They are often heard in political speeches. Biblical scholars confront pretexts in the form of people who cite passages of scripture outside of the full body of work to use a limited excerpt to try to make a point that is not actually present when the passage is taken as part of a larger work. This is the context. When you think of text without context, think about social media or even mass media where information is broken down into sound bites that can be manipulated by the person presenting those sound bites to weave any narrative they like. But let's set aside the public realm and get back to interpersonal communications. How does context matter there? I continue to find in my ongoing interactions with individuals deeply affected by the Israel-Hamas war that there is an individual history layered on top of a family history that creates a set of deeply held beliefs, per perspectives, and emotions, almost at a cellular level. 
This ingrained cellular identity cannot be removed, ignored, or suppressed, particularly when activated by an emotionally charged situation. The only way to understand how a person is reacting to such a circumstance and more importantly, why they are reacting that way is to listen deeply and intently to learn their stories that create the framework they use to view and understand the world. But that's not enough. Just a couple of days ago, I was counseling a friend of mine who was unable to navigate these treacherous waters. And as a result, his friendship with one of our mutual friends went overboard in the storm and drowned. He said that he heard the things our friend was saying, and while he disagreed with his staunch perspectives and was made uncomfortable by what he felt was our friend imposing his views upon him, he could actually understand where our friend was coming from. But he couldn't get from understanding to a place of comfort where they could both carry the friendship forward. He could understand the weight of the situation and the complete lack of buoyancy that was dragging the friendship to the bottom of the ocean, but he couldn't figure out how to make it float or teach it to swim. Here's what I shared with him, and this is what I learned from Mark. It's not enough to understand someone in a crisis situation. Truly effective listening with the power to heal requires you to go several steps further. What are those steps? Mark and I are glad you asked. First, you have to encourage the person to keep talking. No matter how crazy what they are saying might sound to you, you have to let them vent. Second, you have to mirror what they're saying and how they're feeling about it. This doesn't mean you have to agree with them or pretend to agree with them. This is just about meeting them at their level, where they are at that moment. Third, you have to talk with the person, not to them. Pick up on what they are saying and weave your questions and perspectives into the tapestry that is coming off of their loom. Fourth, empathize. Make sure they hear from you not only that you understand what they are feeling, but that you also feel an emotional response yourself as a reaction to the emotional response they are having. Fifth, and this step five is really where I think the magic happens. This is the transformative part. Support their feelings. Again, this is not needing to agree with those feelings. This is about making them know that it is okay for them to feel how they feel, that you understand how they are feeling and why they are feeling that way, and that you fully support them in their feelings, no matter how extreme those feelings may seem to you. You must give your friend license and validation to feel exactly how they are feeling in that moment. When a friend is expressing a powerful set of emotional responses, no matter how aggressive it may come across, you are not witnessing a moment of strength. You are actually witnessing a moment of great vulnerability. If they know that you are willing to stand by them, even when they are experiencing and exhibiting their most irrational and emotional reactions, they will know that they can truly trust you and that will add strength to your friendship or buoyancy to continue the analogy from before. But don't let me fool you. Just because I can break this process down into five steps doesn't mean it's easy. Quite the contrary. It takes tremendous time, patience, practice, and energy. It can be draining to sit to the point of exhaustion. And not everyone is prepared to immerse themselves in such a process. This is the advice I ultimately provided to my friend who is contending with his own physical and mental health challenges. We spoke about it and arrived together at the conclusion that he was not properly equipped to engage in working through this process with our mutual friend. It was healthiest and best for everyone for him to walk away from the friendship, at least for now. And that's also a decision rooted in emotion channeled through the funnel of self-awareness. And in turn, as his friend, I listened and actively expressed my understanding of his feelings and his decision and validated his right to feel and act that way for his own well-being. Meaningful friendship is hard work. Don't let anyone try to tell you otherwise. But at the end of the day, that's what makes true friendship worthwhile. Aside from counseling me in the area of sustaining friendships through times of heightened emotion and conflict, Mark also helped me to deal with very sensitive matters at an institutional level through my engagement with Stanford. In my November episode surrounding extremism and centrism, I highlighted the impact the war in the Middle East was having on higher education back here in the United States. We've seen that play out even further as the presidents of both Penn and Harvard have now been forced to resign based upon pressure following their testimony in front of Congress. 
I spent time in the extremism versus centrism episodes talking about the other forces working to undermine higher education with various agenda that have nothing to do with protecting Jews or Muslims on school campuses or beyond, but which are rallying Jews and Muslims against higher education by playing on their fears and passions. But I want to sidestep these bigger political issues at the national level and focus more today on the human component. This is where Mark and I focused our time together. For the past two months, I've really been on an ongoing listening tour, following the lead of Mark, my listening Sherpa, helping to take me to the top of the mountain of human understanding. The time I've invested has been fascinating, enriching, eye-opening, and emotional. I talked just a few minutes ago about how individual and family histories can shape the perspectives that people bring to events that unfold around them, and how these unique experiences and the emotional programming they produce dramatically change how people react to such circumstances. I'd like to share a couple of examples of the individual stories I've heard that have really helped me to see how deeply personal these situations can be. I'm going to be a little light on the details in these stories and change a few elements in order to protect the privacy of the individuals. As Dak Prescott says, here we go. I met with one woman in New York who was a Jew of Middle Eastern descent. She explained to me how her family had to flee their home country when she was a young child as the result of an expulsion of Jews. She recalled vividly the fear that she felt, and she has a permanent place for Israel in her heart and in her psyche. She still holds on to the ideal of Israel as a place of refuge for the Jews, and on a more personal level, as a place of refuge for her and her immediate family. What impact did this history have upon her view of present events? She had a palpable fear when we spoke of a return to the experiences of her childhood. In the face of passionate protests against Israel and against Jews unfolding right in front of her in New York City, she feared a return to the old ways where anti-Semitism could lead to not only discrimination and hate speech, but also violence against Jews. She had a real fear that she might once again have to pack up her family and flee to Israel to find refuge. And this fear didn't end with her. She explained that she had a daughter enrolled in college in the Midwest at a school with a substantial Jewish population and typically a thriving Jewish life on their campus. She said her daughter was contending with crippling anxiety due to the current events and was in therapy to help her cope with her fears. The imprint of the family's experiences was painfully clear even on the next generation born and raised right here in the United States. I'm sure many of you hear these stories and are shocked by the depth of the emotional response of this family, but what I'm describing is their reality, and no one can explain that away with reasoning or debate. Another tragic circumstance I encountered was a Palestinian American living in California who shared that 67 of his family members have been killed in Gaza in the past two months. Can you imagine losing 67 family members? I don't think I can name 67 family members. The scope of his personal loss made him extremely numb to considering the suffering of anyone else, particularly the suffering of the Israelis during the terror attacks of October 7th, now that he saw Israelis responsible for the decimation of his family. How can I or any one of us judge the validity of such strong emotional responses that these individuals are experiencing based upon past and present events that have impacted them so tremendously? You and I may be able to argue the logic of the Middle Eastern Jewish family I spoke of and may try to point out all of the differences between the Middle East of 40 years ago and America of today, but none of that means anything to them. None of our logical debate can lessen their fear. It may come from an irrational source, but it is quite real. Likewise, many will debate whether the action of Israel and Palestine amounts to genocide. Intellectually and factually, the classification of genocide can be ruled out by identifying the actions as war and by pointing out that the Palestinian population of late is growing, not shrinking. But do you think that one family in Gaza that has been decimated to the tune of 67 family members can see the events around them as anything but genocide? Overall population and demographic statistics mean absolutely nothing to them in the face of such terrible loss. Listening intently to all of these stories, has helped me to understand how truly personal world events can be. It has also underscored Mark Goulston's teachings about the power of listening to people, understanding their feelings, and empathizing with them. It makes me understand how futile institutional policies and public position statements are in trying to adjust the 
range of powerful emotions and reactions that exist in a diverse population. Some influential members of distinct cultural groups at Stanford impacted by current events have shared concerns with me that there is no way to bring people together when there are such disparate perspectives, even within a particular religious or ethnic group. But to me, I see it a bit differently, and I fully credit Mark Goulston with framing this perspective for me. I actually see the wide diversity of perspectives that exist as the opportunity to engage. I see the ability to bring small groups of individuals together and start interacting with people with vastly different perspectives in a facilitated manner to try to give people the opportunity we've discussed, the chance to be heard, the chance to be felt, and the chance to have their feelings validated by others from very different backgrounds. As I've talked to others and thought about these challenges, I say this, our community must be greater than the sum of its policies and public statements. And that's exactly what I'm working to achieve. Within the Stanford community of students, faculty, administration, and alumni, I'm personally committed to trying to make our community more resilient against the challenges of today and inevitable future challenges. I've been engaging in conversations with the leaders of religious and cultural alumni groups like the Stanford Jewish Alumni Network and the Muslim Alumni Association. I don't have a strategy. I don't have a 10-step plan. I just have a vision of creating a dialogue, engagement, and collaboration among even a small group of alumni that can serve as an example and hopefully a catalyst for greater community building. One of my like-minded colleagues from the Jewish Alumni Network asked me, Chad, do you think we are naively optimistic? My response was, I don't think there is such thing as naive optimism, just people who are too short-sighted to see the potential. And he said, I see that just the fact that these discussions are going on right now is a good thing. And I responded, let's hold on to that as our measure of success. While I typically start a Datage's solo cast with the Datage for the day, today I'm going to conclude with it. Here it is. Communication is a two-way street. It can't be built on a one-lane road. We've spent a lot of time here at Datages talking about the value of listening, and that's for very good reason. I truly believe listening is a superpower, and through our time with Mark Goulston, you learn just how powerful listening can be and how to put the power of listening to work for you. Over the course of these episodes, including here today, we talked about listening as a tool for conflict resolution. We explained how important it is in friendships and relationships to use active listening to ensure that people feel understood and feel felt. And we saw how listening can give you a leg up in business negotiations. But let's be honest, whoever made it through life by listening alone? At some point, we all have to speak up. And that's going to be the focus of our next episode of Datages which will provide you some effective tools for communicating, particularly in a business setting. And before we leave today, I have one more dad joke for you about listening. A man is talking to one of his friends about his marital problems. My wife says I have two big issues. One, I don't listen. Yeah? And what's the second? I don't know. Something else. <laughs> Thanks for being such good listeners. And remember, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. 